Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, goblins and gnolls, cats and dogs living together, mass hysteria, welcome back to another exciting day of Lands of Lore. Let's play Baldur's Gate. We're going to smush those two names together because I can never pick on an order. We're playing Baldur's Gate through the Lands of Lore Luther. Let's play in good mode. How you doing? Let's kick it off. We're going straight to Thunderhammer Smith Smithy record, guy. But sure. To figure out what he can do with these mysterious vials. Oh, and we're going to run right into Elminster. Well, now, a path crossed once more. I suppose the proper introductions are in order, as we will no doubt meet again. My name is Elminster. I have heard nothing but tales of thy exploits in the time we have been apart. But it would seem that thou art destined to have quite the impact on the Sword Coast. Quite the burden for one so young. Alright. Uh, just doing what I thought best. That certainly seems to be the case. Thine actions are a testament to charity and free will, whether intentional or not. But enough of my ramblings. Thou hast a long journey ahead of thee, and I will not have my meandering delay thee. I will impart one piece of information before I go. Though tis hardly a surprise, I am sure. The bandits thou dost seek make a habit of traveling in the northeast. With this, I shall take my leave. So yes, that is Elminster tipping us off into one of the three kind of ways you can figure out where to go in the plot now. Oh, and Chloe is bright and quick to remind us of what the second of the thir three ways. Yeah, Luther of Gladstone! Luther of Gladstone! Someone in the Jovial Juggler gave me a gold piece to come find you! Uh, slow down, uh, breathless child. Who is tossing money about in hopes of finding me. Her name's Officer Vi, and she's with the Flaming Fist. And you needn't worry, she's real nice. Thank you, child. You have uh, earned your gold piece. I will go to the Jovial Juggler and meet with this Officer Vi shortly. Good. You folks are real nice. Mama says the Sword Coast needs some real heroes these days. Uh, Timora be with you, okay? Timora, of course, being the goddess of luck, so it's just a way of saying luck be with you. Okay! I'm not now that we got work. all of the plot ways, uh, or rather the plot dialogues out of the way. Might work. We, can, <laughs> we can actually make our way to Tarum. Furium, otherwise known in my brain as Thunderhammer Smithy, Smithy Guy, because no one can pronounce that name. Hold on. Ter Terum. Okay. Farron, right, is spelled similar, so maybe it's Terum. Terum? But that, that second name, Fu, Fu, oh boy, Fui Ruum, Fui, Fui Ruum. It's not English. All right. Well, hello there. Is there anything I can do for you on this fine fair day? Uh, I've just come from Nashkel. I found this vial on one of the kobolds lurking in the mines. I think it might be what's causing the iron to break. You found it just like that? Well, that certainly does illuminate things, does it? I thought maybe you could use it to find a way to reverse the effects? I couldn't know, but I know someone who can. Give me a few days, and I should have some results. I really don't remember this being in the original game, and if it is, I clearly just never did it. Probably because I tended to, after a certain point, never read anything any NPC tells you ever. Admittedly, that kind of makes me the worst Baldur's Gate player in the world, since half the game is the story. At some point, I just played it more like a mechanics simulator, which is funny because you would think that would make me the kind of person to love Icewind Dale, but Icewind Dale is garbage. Fight me on that. Okay. Anyway, enough tirades about the Infinity oh, Engine games. Heck? Apparently, Thunderhammer Smithy Guy, or Terum, as I suppose we shall attempt to An call him, request. uh has let us know that it's going to take a few days for him to actually figure out what's going on with the iron. Or rather, for him to get in contact with his contact, a guy who knows a guy about reversing the uh, iron's breakage effects. Can I assist you? Oh boy. Ah, Luther of Gladstone. I thought it might be you. These southern parts are set quite afire with talk of your work in Nashgal. 
I'm Officer Vi of the Flaming Fist, and to be honest, I could use your help. I am uh, honored to be found worthy of your notice, Officer. How can I be of assistance? My contingent and I are cut off from Baldur's Gate. We haven't received any new orders for close to a week, and to be honest, I don't like the feel of it, this at all. The bandit raids have been getting worse since you returned from Nashgale. I used to think that they were just your usual brigands out to make a quick buck in troubled times, but not anymore. They're working for someone. One way or another, I've got to get my troops back to the gate. I'll pay 50 gold pieces for every bandit scalp you can bring me, and spread the news. I want this whole region cleared before winter comes. Interesting that time passes in Baldur's Gate, and I suppose if you went to an inn and slept long enough, winter could technically come and go. What day is it? Does our journal tell it? This is a weird journal interface. This isn't the normal journal interface. What happened to the old one? That's fine. This is simple. Oh, we can <laughs> search terms? What is this? Hold on. What if I type in cobalt here? What is this? The future? Holy crap, guys. We can... We can search things in our... That's insane. Well, that actually makes the journal usable, doesn't it? Welcome to the future. Okay, well, anyway. Uh, yeah. Um, what day... Is... We still don't know what day it is. Day 26. Oh, okay. So it, it doesn't actually tell us the day of the... Oh, it does! No, day 28, Myrtle. 1368. Awesome! There's a chronology now. That's new. I'm I'm pretty sure it didn't used to say the year and the month. Uh, perhaps they reverse engineered an approximation of what year this game took place, perhaps from the books. I never read the Baldur's Gate books, but uh, they are out there and I'm sure they... Eno enough about this. We, we just got orders from Officer Vi to go out and... Um... Oh boy. From Officer Vi to go out and hunt bandits. And sorry, I had a brief moment where I just realized why the phrase Officer Vi sounds f so familiar. I know this might deeply drop my already low opinion, or your already low opinion of me, but I, yes, at one point in my life, followed League of Legends very closely. I still enjoy the game from time to time, but I'm not nearly as obsessed as I used to. But there is a skin for the character named Vi called Officer Vi, so odd connection there. Okay, let's actually get back to the game. Girk here says, I so everyone's heard, everyone rubberneck, everyone's a rubbernecker then, is that it? Old Girk had his famous cloak stolen right off his back by a batch of paltry tassel. Yeah, yeah, it's old news, and if you make one crack about the cloakwood being an appropriate place to lose it, at least I'll put your liver on the menu. Now move on and let the next people in line have their laugh. Girk, we weren't saying anything about tassel or cloakwood or your cloak. Oh! Oh, I get it! Cloakwood! He lost his cloak and... Okay, see, that's funny. I wouldn't have even noticed if he hadn't said anything. He get it? He lost his cloak in... Clo okay, yeah. You guys are a thousand years ahead of me. You already caught it probably the moment he said it. Hello, friends. Welcome and make yourself at home. Just try not to prattle of the locals none, okay? Time is pretty harsh right now, and people don't need any more trouble than they've got. So, what can I do for you? Uh, show me a list of your services. Fortunately, there's not much to do with the Jovial Juggler other than to sleep, and I don't think we need to sleep, do we? Uh, what are our spells looking like here? Oh, no, we are down three Cure Light Wounds, and... Right, right, Dinahair needs to get rid of the comical number of identification spells she has. Unfortunately, it's boring, but Magic Missile really is just the go-to here. Protection from, protection from petrification, very useful in the proper circumstances. Those circumstances basically equate to two points in the game where you actually encounter Basilisks. Aside from those two points, you will probably never need to have protection from, from petrification memorized. Blindness is a good one. Blindness is actually good. Uh, temporary blindness. I don't remember why. We're going to need to read here. Saving throw is allowed. And then it completely negates the effects if save versed. But otherwise, yeah. Target receives a minus four to attack and armor class. Th this is a very good spell to have when you're going against just like a single strong target with high armor class and high Faka or low Faka, whatever. You know what I mean. Okay, so. 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm spacing out. All right, so uh, this essentially is useful because uh, unlike a lot of low level one spells, the target just makes a straight up saving throw. Now I know we don't have it, but a spell like sleep will just straight up not affect monsters over a certain hit die. So it's nice that it will still affect higher level enemies, even though it's a low level spell, assuming of course they fail their saving throw, which is obviously not guaranteed. Okay. No, Chesney's I'm losing here. it at 11 o'clock at night on a random Sunday, apparently. Uh, we're good. We have no reason to snoop around the inn. We'll take Officer Vi at her word. Oh, who's this guy? Bjornin? Yes. They did quite a number on me, those half-ogres. There's a band of them fortifying themselves in the mountains southwest of here. If you could give them a taste of justice, then that would do me proud. Sure, Bjornin. Alright, let's go kill some half-ogres. I know Vi just asked us to go murder bandits, but we can kill two bandits with one stone. Uh, we need to wait for Thunderhammer Smithy guy, Terum, to go do his thing what anyway, so we might as well kill some time while we're doing that. Alright, to the... Oh, what direction did he say? It's so south. Southwest. South-southwest from here. Does that mean we need to go... Alright, well, first off, we actually need to go west instead of east. Chesney, again, displaying his knowledge of the cardinal directions is questionable. Hey! Khalid! Come on, friend. An unexpected request, but sure. Alright, guys. Now that you've properly grouped... Okay, so we're gonna go south one... And then what West the one? Will that work? What did he say they were? Bjornin said they were uh, half ogres. Okay, so those are going to be a little bit humanoid looking. Kind of a bit skinnier than an Ogrillion, but about as tall. Ogrillions, of course, being... Oh no, my fantasy knowledge is being called into question. Ogrillians are half human, right? That's how an Ogrillian is made. Obviously a half ogre is a half ogre and half human. But Ogrillians get the fancy name. Wait a minute, no that can't be right. I just said Ogrillians are half ogres. What, what on earth? What's the difference between an Ogrillian and a half ogre? Perhaps one takes after the human side and one takes after the ogre side. What the heck? Okay, we're here in a southwest-ish kind of place. He said south southwest, so maybe we need to go south one more. Shh! I'm spying on Basilis and his spooks. They're funny. Uh, Footy, the child, is telling us this. This is no place for a child. Run home to Bergos at once. Run every step of the way. I ain't got no home to go there. Not since Mom and Johnny disappeared. I've been looking for them, but all I can find is these spooks. One of them's wearing Johnny's knickers, though. But I don't want to think of where he got him. Be careful that you don't scare Basilis, okay? Oh, that can't be good. Well, we came here to hunt half-ogres, but clearly we have to put an end to this basilisk bro. Oh boy, what is even happening? You surrender or you die. You make choice, and you make choice quickly. Zaga has no patience to wait for you slow-witted silly f city folk. Hmm. Time to die, you ugly knob goblins. You very stupid for city folk. You die screaming. Zargo is the strongest one there is. Alright, so we've been set upon by a group of hobgoblins led by Zargol, the... What shall we call him? Zargol the Strongest. Of course, we'll pull Luther out in front and then just pull the rest of the party in. It looks like Zargol himself has decided to break ranks and leave. Oh my gosh, we reset our spells, but we didn't sleep. That's fine. Uh, Zargol himself has decided to attempt to engage here... And uh, that was a poor, poor placement of Jahira while we tried to have her cast Bless. Knocked out of the spell, that's fine. We'll have the rest of the party just run Zargal down. Apparently he's not that threatening. Assuming that somebody can land a hit on him. He's gained morale failure, or rather I should say he's suffering from morale failure. Jahira 
taking a lot of unnecessary hits, we really should just pull her back and use her ranged weapons. M1 landing the last hit on a 19 roll. Oh, and we see wandering skeletons. That can never be a good thing. We'll go ahead and, and grab quickly the loot that Zargal dropped, including some kind of funky sword. We'll be able to identify that if only we had kept one of those identification spells of Dynahair. It's not a bad idea, of course, to just keep your wizard with one identification spell on hand at all times. Luckily, Luther does have his Cure Light Wound spell. He gained a second one from having the second good dream, so to, so to call it. And we will attempt a quick rest. I'm not surprised. Failed by being set upon by skeletons, and the remainder of Zargal's crew is going to be here, so we're going to need to back off a little bit. Sure. These are dart-throwing skeletons, so we're going to need... Oh my gosh! What is happening? Alright, we have hobgoblins here, skeletons here, wolves here, Basilis and his madness up here. What do we do? Well, I think we need to find a more defensible position. So, first off, let's swap everyone over to their melee weapons so that when they're running past... Oh, does Dynanar, Dynahair not have a quarterstaff? Apparently she does not. Anyway, we'll swap everyone over to their melee so they don't accrue penalties when they're running past these wolves. We're going to do our best to micro our back line around them. It's not as important that the front line micros simply because of their higher armor class. They'll be a little safer and higher HP pool. Okay. Khalid and Luther have been kind of blocked off by the wolves, and that's fine. We'll pull Khalid back here, and the rest of the party will begin engaging from a distance. Oh, and apparently we didn't swap Jahira over to her club for some reason, but that's fine. Now, we want to pull, because I think Khalid has a lower AC technically than Luther. We want to pull Khalid back so those skeletons start to target Luther. We're going to be dumping a lot of attention on Luther, but that's fine. He should be able to take it. Especially because at this point, our armor class coupled with our level certainly allows us to do a lot better job of tanking. Unfortunately, Geltic and Malkax, Zargul's friends, have decided to join the fight, poisoning Luther with their arrows here. We're going to need to do something fancy in order to change the outcome of this fight. Otherwise, if we just try to straight up muscle our way through it, it probably won't work. The question is, what among our limited resource items will allow us to even perform such a feat? Now, we do have this Scroll of Grease that we just picked up from a body. Now, I don't think it's a terribly useful spell in this situation, mostly because, yes, I, I believe it only allows, or re rather, it only, in, it inflicts slow, essentially, in an area, but Grease covers a creature entering. Spell must save or slip slide be unable to move efficiently. They can move, but slowly. Yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't really change their stats or anything, so we could cast it, but these are all ranged fighters. They're, they don't need to move anyway, so it doesn't matter. I'm not surprised, but what? You <sighs> I suppose we should just use the Wand of Frost. Now, does the Wand of Frost have a secondary AoE charge, or is that just the Wand of Fire that I'm thinking? Yeah, it looks like this is only... The Wand of Frost only has one use. We'll go ahead and nuke one of the two hobgoblins. Dynahair will here. Oh, Dynahair has... What? Apparently Dynahair, as a special kind of thing, she has the ability to slow poison. I didn't know that. We could have her slow poison, but we want her to hit those hobgoblins as soon as possible. So we're still going to have Luther drink the antidote, but her slow poison will make a fantastic backup if somebody gets poisoned again. Okay, Luther lost his poison, that's great. Party will continue to engage here like this, and Dynahair is going in for that Wand of Frost, and that's a dead, dead Geltic. That should help significantly reduce the number of poison arrows flying our way. We still need to chew through this front line, though, first, before we can really try to rush past and deal with the final hobgoblin. Although, Melkax here? I don't know. We could just send Khalid after him. I bet he'd swap over to his melee attack if we did. Yeah, because the, the rest of the group, the skeletons ran out of their darts, so they're now focusing on Luther with their, I'm assuming, clubs or maces or something. 
Kelly is definitely free to come over and engage Malkax here, and that's forcing Malkax to switch over to his melee combat. Okay, so we're safe from poison. The skeletons are quickly being dispatched. The wolves are gone. We are now again in control of the situation. At this point, it's pretty much just going to be us letting the timer run out on the turns as uh, everyone rolls their attacks and whatnot. I'm not surprised. Wow, took 19 slashing damage from Luther, and that's not low. Okay. Well, that was dicey for a moment, but we managed to pull through it pretty nicely. Fortunately, we did not get a successful rest, and Kelly here, the buddy, has uh, gone leveled up, which is great. Go ahead and put another point in long swords for him. All the more powerful for it. Fortunately, none of these enemies dropped a quarter staff or anything for Dinahair, so she's still sporting that sling, which is fine. We almost never actually need her to use her quarter staff. Successful rest will give us the opportunity to drop a healing spell on Kali. Luther can tough it out. He's only four points down at this point. Okay. The hobgoblin's dead. The wolves gone. The skeleton's gone. Now all we need to do is confront Basilis. And we see there a zombie, so that must have been what foot he meant when he said he saw a spook wearing his brother's shorts, which is unfortunate because it means um, his brother has uh, been turned into a zombie. Alright, so Basilis, the voice actor, went ahead and read the line, but uh, it does appear that Basilis is speaking to the undead as if they are actually who they are. No, don't hesitate on my account. Some of the others may not have heard them. Uh, hold your peace then, though I remember a time back at the Zental Keep when you would sooner die than be quiet. You would sooner... Uh, I'll wait till you feel like telling them yourself. I don't remember the old days so well. So Basilis is unfortunately suffering from an extreme amount of post-traumatic stress syndrome or stress disorder or whatever, PTSD. Uh, he has witnessed the slaughter of many people who were close to him and has therefore went insane, uh, blocked off the past part of his memory so that he can't actually remember those deaths, and has raised all of his dead friends and family um, to serve as objects to represent what he lost? I don't know. You get the gist, right? Uh, you there. Uh, what is the meaning of this? Who dares interrupt while I speak with my family? I'll have your heads if you're here to harm the... No, it can't be. Is that you, father? It cannot be otherwise. You haven't changed a bit in all these years. Okay, now at one point I knew the proper dialogue options here that we can avoid confrontation... Um, that would be metagaming, but not that I have a problem with that. The real problem is, I've forgotten completely what those dialogue options are. So we will instead roleplay as to what good Luther would do. Unfortunately, I'm at an impasse. Here in the first one, we can tell the truth, but here in the third one, we can pretend to be... Basilis's father, perhaps in an effort to soothe who is someone who is obviously a madman. I will go ahead and allow us to choose that one, uh, since even though it is lying to an extent, we are chaotic good, if you remember. We do not have to follow the law. Uh, so, we responded, of course, with, uh, I forgot to read the line. Uh, yes, son, it's certainly been a long time. Uh, how are you doing, my boy? About as well as can be expected, I guess. It has been difficult, but I've got most of my family back together. Some did not seem to recognize me at first, but I, I helped them recall. Okay, so if memory serves correctly, if you go along with the facade, 
and mentions Zentil Keep, Basilis will remember that he... He will remember that everyone at Zentil Keep is dead. So, also, if we confront him and immediately tell him they are zombies, I think he also will go crazy, although not 100% sure on that. I want to say we have to tell him that we are disappointed. So, I am disappointed in you, in you, son. These are not your family, and it is an abomination to suggest it. No! Time has made you forget just like the others! But I can remind you, and we'll all be family again! Hold still! Okay, apparently that was not the right dialogue option. That's fine. We're gonna back off, because this is a lot of, kind of, rabble enemies to deal with, plus... Oh boy! And there is Luther being affected by rigid thinking. We are going to pull the rest of the non-rigid party members way, way back here. We already know that Zargal and his friends are gone, so we don't need to worry about them being over here. And we're effectively just going to kind of sit here and wait for that rigid thinking spell to wear off. This skeleton is using some kind of crossbow and is just taking pot shots at Luther. That is, funnily enough, fine. I don't think he's really going to hit Luther. Oh! Oh no. Oh no. Now Luther has decided to go in. He's charging at the skeleton. We're going- Oh! And he killed- Oh! And now he's continuing to go. This is- This is quickly going from bad to worse. At least Luther is doing relatively what we would want him to do anyway. He's attacking the enemies. He's taking them down quite a bit. And Basilis seems to be ignoring him, which is fine. He hasn't taken any damage le yet. We're just going to let him continue to do his thing. The party is going to follow behind. Apparently one of the skeletons has actually spotted the party, so the party will engage with Khalid up in the front. Luther continues to aimlessly wander around while as a zombie and a uh, skeleton pursue him, Luther takes three damage from one of the missile attacks, but again, that's fine. We'll continue to still try to sweep out this skeleton up top, there's another hobgoblin, but it does not appear to be part of Zargul's party, as it was just a simple hobgoblin elite. Still a dangerous enemy, but it doesn't seem like it went after Luther, so that's a plus for us. We're going to try to deal with this last skeleton here while mean, uh, Luther continues to stand around, looking a little bit slack-jawed. Another skeleton has spotted us with a third on its way. We're going to pull Kali back, because the last thing we want to do is get Basilis' attention. Luther's still standing around. Wait, Luther has lost his rigidity. Okay, uh, that sounded funny. Oh no, it's a terrible thing when you lose your rigidity. Uh, Alright, so Luther will now, within our control, engage in combat down here. Uh, by that explosion sound effect, it sounds like he detonated the zombie, and he did. And now focus on the second skeleton. I'm sure he'll make quick work of that one while the party focuses on this other one. Second skeleton for Luther dies. Final skeleton falls for the party. We shall regroup now and prepare ourselves for the fight against Basilis. Now, we have a couple of options. We could engage and immediately use our Wand of Blizzard. However, since we've thinned the ranks of his undead out by quite a bit, I feel pretty comfortable coming in here and not needing to use the Wand of Blizzard. We can probably just attempt to disrupt him with the party's ranged attacks in combination with Dynahair's magic missile. Now we've managed to get the attention of another skeleton, we'll go ahead and draw it out. Basically, we just don't want a snafu situation. We don't... I, this is playing overly cautious, uh, I, you know, fully admit that, but the worst case scenario is if Basilis has some kind of hold person spell, manages to get the wrong party member snagged in hold person, and that person gets surrounded by all of these low-level kind of fodder undead. Now, we did get Basilis' attention. This zombie refuses to get dragged out, and that's fine. Basilis is casting Hold Person on Luther of Gladstone. We're going to have him run one direction. The party will run the opposite because the spell will follow Luther, but it's area of effect. So if... Yeah, okay, we do see the success of Basilis in freezing Luther. But because we pulled the party away... It's going to prevent the entire party from being held in case one of those zombies or skeletons decides to come over and uh, cause trouble. We are just going to run the clock out on this. Luckily, or not luckily, thankfully, they lowered the duration of spells like Rigidity, like Hold Person in Baldur's Gate 2, and I believe those rules got backdated into the remake of Baldur's Gate 2 Enhanced Edition, so I'm fairly certain we're running on Baldur's Gate 2 rules where the spell 
here will last still quite a long time, but not nearly as long as it used to. Oh my goodness, the original Baldur's Gate, the duration on those spells were hilariously long. Like, you just had to sit and like go make a sandwich or something while you waited for your entire party to unrigidify or something so that you could just save the game. Because I believe, I'm going to quick try to quick save. Oh no, you can save. I'm sorry, I thought you couldn't quick save while your party was affected by a spell like that. I must just be wrong. There we go. Okay, spells worn off. But sure. And we're just going to go in and attempt the same thing. In fact, let's swap Luther over to his bow. Khalid over to his bow. And we'll try to pick off some of these rabble undead without getting close enough to draw Basilis's attention. Alright, good enough. Oh, that zombie decided to leave his corner. Where did he go? Oh, no, he's just hidden in the fog of war. Zombie goes down. Perhaps we can get... No? Can't get the next zombie without triggering Basilisk, but for some reason, Basilisk just decided to walk away. He just kind of noped out. Dinah here is in a bad spot here to be targeted, so we're going to pull the party back again. We'll just focus on taking these guys out. Per the norm, we're going to pull Luther up front so that hopefully... The skeleton will stop shooting arrows at our non-shielded party members. Basilisk decides to rejoin the fight. We're going to pull the party back again. He's probably casting whatever this is at Luther. It's another whole person spell. It does succeed again. Our save verse... What is it? Save verse... Do we not even get a save? Yeah, just held. We have combat rolls turned on. Surely the save rolls would be... Maybe you don't get to see the save ro the save rolls. That's kind of annoying. What's our, I, you would assume it's like save versus spell or something, or perhaps paralysis. Save versus spell is not great. Fifteen. How do you raise that? I don't know. I don't know how the save verses are calculated. That's something I've never tried to study before. Maybe I should read up on that. We start out the day to go to Thunder Hammer Smithy with uh, Tarim. We go, we go to uh, give Tarim some vials and immediately get sidetracked on wacky hijinks. This is starting to feel more like the evil uh, route that we've been experiencing. Although, if it was the evil route, probably seven people would have died by now, and comically, we still would not have the ability to identify magical items. Come on, Luther, wake up here, buddy. Thank you. Oh, an unexpected request. Rinse and repeat, more of the same. It's boring, but you just can't fight or do anything if your party is frozen. We're going to try to engage Basilis here directly. Probably enough of the rabble is dead that this is safe-ish. We're going to have Dynahair try to disrupt the spell with Magic Missile. Was not effective. Is that a web spell? I think we have a web spell. No, it's Entangle. Wait a minute, does that mean... What? I didn't think clerics could learn Entangle. Is he a cleric druid? Because I don't think druids can learn whole person. Well, regardless, we're in kind of trouble here because if we get entangled, we're not going to be able to maneuver. Uh, however, all of the guys here in the... Whoa! What happened? Uh, all of the guys here in the Entangled range uh, at least have ranged weapons, so they will continue to fight even if they get rooted. Ah, and this would explain why Luther just suddenly took 16 damage plus 5 bonus. Is that calculated in with the 16, or is that 16 plus 5? We can do some quick math to figure that out. Luther had 38, right? Or somewhere around there. Now he has 18. Gosh darn it, I should have paid better attention. I guess I can't figure that out. Well, anyway, Luther took a lot of damage. We'll heal it off with a Cure Light Wound spell. I'm... Though that was a crit and not the norm, why did that fail? I don't know why Luther went to go cast Luther of Gladstone's spell casting failure. Why did that happen? Wait a minute, is there a casting percentage failure based on armor being worn? Why did we have casting failure? I'm not entirely certain why that happened. That's okay, there must have been something that triggered it. Perhaps he took a step or something. 
Or maybe the entangled web somehow affected him, even though he's not affected by it. Regardless, we'll go round two. We'll attempt to heal, have Luther heal himself. Dynahair will continue to cast Magic Missile here on Basilisk. Just trying to keep him busy. And there's a good strong hit from Luther, it looks like. 16 slashing. But funnily enough... Basilisk rolled... Was that another critical hit? Oh my goodness. Basilisk rolled two, 20 crit, uh, two natural 20 crits in a row. Dealing 16 damage to Luther on both times. Oh, wait a minute, we can do math, can't we? No, we can't, because Luther healed himself. Hold on, hold on. He had 18, right? Cure Light Wounds heals 8, right? Just, just a guaranteed 8, if I'm not mistaken. 8, okay. So 18 plus 8, that would be 26. Now he's down to 9, which would be... Come on, Chesney, do math, do math. 28 to 9. Oh, why can't I do math? Hold up, hold up, hold up. No, 26. He had 26, so I just need to do 26 minus 9. This is why you should never do math when you're, when you're recording. 26 minus 9 is 17, right? Well, yeah, it is. Oh, 17... But he took one bonus electricity, so that would be 16. Minus 5 would be 10. Where did the extra HP of damage come from? Oh, who cares? I'm pretty sure it's 16 plus 5. So he took 22 points of damage. Or something. Regardless, now that the critting madman is finally gone... We probably should have Jahira run over and cast a quick Cure Light Wounds on Luther. He's probably fine. I don't foresee these skeletons actually killing him. But on the off chance that one of them rolls a crit, that would be extremely unfortunate. Okay, so he's back in the safety zone. Jahira really should not be drawing the attention of these skeletons. And at this point, we're just going to muscle our way through the remaining undead. Yikes! Did not expect the double crit from Basilisk. That turned what should have been a relatively routine fight where we had properly doctored the situation to reach a point of safety by weeding out all of the undead, killing them off one by one, and it still didn't matter. Basilisk with his back-to-back -back crits. I'm impressed. Okay, magical items galore. Including a bit of gems a bit of gems a few gems Chesney can English really good is this Joseph's no okay none of these greenstone rings or rather none of these none of these uh, gems or jewelry are quest related now we do have the ability to write magic we're not going to scum save because grease is just not a spell that is important and oh my goodness how many times have we failed on a 75 percent is this just what is it called what is it called uh negativity bias this has to be negativity bias right is there a way no i i i would never uh the only way to actually determine whether it was negativity bias is to go back and count i i don't please don't do that it's not worth it um but I'm curious whether or not it is negativity bias or whether we have actually had um, a bad string of luck here. Now, we can only identify one of these. None of them are probably specifically important. We do have a short sword here, but the only person who uses short swords is Imwen. Not important because she's going to be using her bow through the majority of all situations. Now, Gauntlets of Fumbling, Elendur's gloves of misplacement with mischief in mind the impetuous elander set out to craft these cursed gauntlets to best a rival it turns out his malice got the best of him when he mistook these gloves for another pair so a guy created these terrible gauntlets that give you minus 10 thaco and minus two decks that's terrible now was basilis wearing those is that is that what caused him to go crazy, or was he, he couldn't have been? He rolled two 20s, right? Although I suppose the 20s don't really take into account your Thaco. 
Ah, there's Joseph's green stone ring. We'll give all quest items to Luther. Okay, that was so much babbling and analysis, but we're here. We're at the end. Wait, no, we're not, because we still have those ogres to kill. Uh, well, as it was sung in The Hobbits, the road goes ever on and on. It's actually probably worth it to take another snooze because of our HP situation. Jahira unable to put a second point in club. Probably just going to be lame and put a point in... I don't know, single weapon style? Probably shouldn't. Probably should do two weapon... Or, sorry, sword and shield style. Can you, can you use... I thought you could use shields with slings, but can you not do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely sword and shield style is what we want. It's going to pr help protect her when she does have her shield out. Yeah, you can totally use shields while you use slings. So that's going to be nice. It's going to protect her since we consider her part of our backline, even though she's kind of a pseudo backline slash frontline fighter. That'll allow her to not be as susceptible from ranged attacks. That's if one of these pesky ranged attackers decides to target her instead of frontline. Anyway. Was that a fighter level or a druid level? Looks like it was a druid level. Or was it both? Take a look. Hotkeys. Hotkeys! Alright. Fighter level 3, druid level 3. Probably was both levels at the same time because we're now having access to level 2 druid spells. Okay, Barkskin, never really a bad choice, but it is a defensive option, and defense tends not to be my style. Good berries, <laughs> good berries. Good berries is kind of, it's kind of trolly. So, the thing you can do about good berries is cast a bunch Create a bunch of good berries, and now suddenly you have all these berries in your inventory that can heal 1 HP. I did this a lot as a kid. I had a lot more patience and a lot more time back then. You know, I would fill up all the party members' inventory with good berries, so they could heal 1 HP at any time. In function, it takes too much real life time to constantly click the good berries, because you have to think, they only heal 1 HP at a time. So. Technically, yes, it would be useful if you could fill up everyone's inventory with good berries, but functionally, it's not worth the effort. Flame ba Blade is interesting. I believe it counts as a scimitar, is it? With this spell, Blazing Red Hawn Sword is wielded as if it were a sword the caster already knows how to use. Hence, there are no bonuses or penalties. Ah, so it treats it as if it is a weapon type with one pip in the weapon. I want to say the way they got around this is this used to be a flaming scimitar. And what they actually did with Jahira is they gave her one pip in scimitars or whatever, whatever scimitars were back then. Were they actually scimitars or were they just rolled up into long swords? Anyway, they did that specifically for Jahira so that she could use the Flaming Scimitar spell as if it was a weapon she was familiar with. Apparently the rules got changed at some point because now it is considered a weapon they are already proficient with. Creature takes 1d4 points of slashing plus an additional 1d2 plus 4 of fire. So at a bare minimum, they're taking, assuming they have no resistances, they're taking 6 points of damage. However, it is not a magical sense, a magical weapon in the normal sense of the term, so creatures struck only by magical weapons are not harmed by it. That really does not seem terribly useful. Let's compare that to the plus one club here. Plus one club is 1d6 plus one, Thaco plus one, so already we're getting a Thaco plus one, and a minimum of two damage versus six. Now let's compare maximum damage of seven versus what? Oh, we can't hotkey because we're on a description screen. So a minimum of seven versus, or sorry, a maximum of seven versus a maximum of 10. So it looks a little better when you compare maximum numbers. Flame Blade will on average deal more damage than Jahira's Club. I think the real 
reason we'll never use it is because we don't really want you here to be a frontline fighter. Doom is an interesting spell. Doom, oh wait, we're like not, we're in the level one spells. Okay, Doom is an interesting spell, but we're not going to use it because Cure Light Wounds is just too useful or too quality of life helpful. Charm, Person, or Mammal is fun. Now, I don't remember the specifics on this one. Spells recipient fails. Saving throw with a plus three modifier. Regards the caster as a trusted friend and ally. Spell. Okay, so it's just the charm person spell with a plus three modifier. I want to say. Uh, the problem is I can't remember. I can't remember if plus three modifier is good or bad. I should probably make a note of that. I'm going to write it down a note to check. To study saving throws okay note made hopefully i'll be more educated next time we meet but yeah charm person's pretty decent of course it's a completely blank spell if the target resists the or rather rolls correctly on the saving throw so the poison's nice and in fact i would usually take one but with Dynahair, with the special ability to just cast Slow Poison at will, I don't think we need it. Bark Skin is nice. Skin becomes tough as Bark, increasing base armor class to 6, plus 1 for every 4 levels of the Priest, which is awesome. Uh, you get Scaling with this spell for every 4 levels. Um, pretty nice. Probably Jahira is not going to hit 8 in Baldur's Gate 1, although I know they raise the EXP cap, so I don't know, maybe she will. But she's dual class, I'm going to say she probably won't. So, this essentially sets someone's AC to 5. Uh, so like, what is Luther's base AC? Like, 6? But the, but the 4... Okay, hold on, but we're getting plus 4 from Dex. So, wearing no armor, because I'm pretty sure it stacks with dex, wearing no armor, Luther could have an armor class of 1. And I believe it still stacks with all your gear. So, he, sh he could have a very low armor class, um, which makes Barkskin probably the best overall choice here. And because we don't need to take Slow Poison, uh, we'll go ahead and take Charm mammal or person resist fire and cold is nice but not it's it's situational right you kind of have to know you're going to encounter something with a lot of fire or point, ice but sure we're just gonna not mess with it essentially all right we'll take a snooze no, hp back work. up to normal spells back another chance to identify items with dynahair the whistling sword short sword it's just a 1d6 plus 2 i don't know why it has a funny name it has a backstory that we're not going to read. We'll go ahead and give that to Imwin. Plus two is obviously better than plus one. We'll have her hold on to this so that we can sell it later. And in fact, let's just dump these gauntlets. We don't need them. Excellent. An unexpected request, but sure. Okay, back to the original plan at hand. My friends, I have been all over the board today as far as what we've been discussing, and I know that I have not even been discussing it in the most coherent manner. If you're still here, thank you. Hope you're at least having some fun watching Chesney analyze random stats like the crazy mad person that he is. Alright, here we are, half ogres. This seems to be the right place, the place that Bjornin was discussing. Imoen getting a little too eager to try out that short sword we just gave her. We'll go ahead and split up the party have them all attack different targets, just kind of spread out the damage, make things a little easier. We'll drop a magic missile just because, ugh, that's so sad. Magic missile really doesn't get good until the later levels. Taking a lot of damage Khalid is, which is, I suppose understandable Ogrillians or Half Ogres, sorry, we're fighting Half Ogres. I'm assuming Half Ogres probably have a decently high strength stat, which would give them better Thaco overall. They all fell, we got Vampiric Touch, not a great spell unless you're specifically building your mage around it. So of course we memorize it, although, to be honest, um, Grease wasn't any better, so I'm just being definitely being affected by negativity bi uh, bias now. Although, what is it, a level 3 spell? I thought it was a level 2 spell. 
Where's Vampiric Touch? Level four or five, is it? We just wrote no, it. Not in here. Where, where did I? I must be missing it. Is it here? Vampire touch? No. 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 D dispels no longer appear in your spell book if you're not at a high enough sure. level to cast them. I didn't think that was the case because otherwise we wouldn't be able to see these. Where, where did vampire touch go? We got experience points for learning it. Ten. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We, if we got 10, it should be a level 1 spell. Am I just not seeing it? Blindness. Chill. Can, can we scroll this? How do we... Maybe it was Chill Touch. Oh my gosh, it was Chill Touch. Oh, whoop, scary. We lost the interface. It was Chill Touch. False alarm. Oh my goodness. More skeletons. I believe they are resistant to slashing. Yeah, five damage resisted from Luther. Probably resistant to piercing as well, although our sling-wielding friends are likely not affected by the resistance. Just kind of a long waiting game while we wait for the party to clean these guys up. There's no need to expend any important resources on them. Especially since our frontline fighters are more than capable of resisting likely any roll save a 20 from them. Speaking of, that makes me nervous. We should heal Khalid. What is the duration on Bard Skin? It's something we need to know. Duration. Four rounds plus one round per level. So currently seven rounds. That's enough for combat. But it's not long enough to just throw down on a character without intentionally knowing that there's a combat that we're going to go into. Okay, we're going to go ahead and use Luther's curing spell on himself. Normally I like to save those since they're instant cast, but having two targets, two separate targets that can cast curing cure light wounds to me is a little more valuable than having two on one. Cuz you never know who's going to need the help and who's going to be preoccupied. This house looks abandoned. Oh. Apparently Torlo here is fishing on the docks. If you need something stranger Please keep your voice down, will you? It's hard enough getting the hang of this fish wrangling business without you scaring them all away. My uh, apologies. I'll leave you to your work. I thank you. Though this is not my true calling, I much prefer the mines, but I also prefer remaining alive. It's simply not a safe time to be a man of the deeps. Have to feed my family somehow, though. I'm not an unexpected request. Well, sure. more information on the mines being all messed up, although our recent action should hopefully fix that problem. Chalon is here. Hello, pal. A hearty welcome to you. Come to test your metal against the denizens of the water, have you? A fine profession it is, and I've not enjoyed myself in ages. Simply ages. <laughs> well, even though this isn't what we're going to choose, we have to. I have to at least read the top response. You stay by the water in case the villagers come at you with torches, don't you? Wow, there is no... There is no um, kind response here. So I suppose we'll go with this one. Uh, pardon me for uh, noticing, but you seem a touch... Uh, how shall I put this? A touch loony. You are entitled to your interpretation, though I prefer to think of myself as an optimist. Uh, I've been put out to... Out of work because of the iron shortage too, blah blah blah, and all that rot. I've simply chosen not to let it get me down. So I'm out of the mine. So what? I'll fish for food and look decidedly less pale at the end of the day because I got some sun for a change. Now if you don't mind, I've got some singing to do. Oh, singing. Sing for us, Chellen. Oh, he'll just uh, keep going around in circles. Alright, well, we'll let... We'll leave Chellen to his singing whilst we continue to 
thin out the half ogre population around here. Quite shocking that these two managed to come up to this river and apparently this abandoned house, which one would assume was its original occupants, perhaps ousted by... Oh dear, what's happening? Uh, uh, anyway, funny... Uh, what, to, to finish that train of thought, it's funny to imagine that those two fishermen some, somehow managed to sneak past all the half-ogres. Now we have someone named Tengen talking to us. I don't have a voice for them, so I'm just going to make one up. Let's stop where you are. If you throw down your weapons and uh, cooperate, then no one will be hurt. If you don't, then you'll all die. A very simple decision on your part. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. What is it you want with us, and who are you? My name is Tengen. This is my girl, Jembi. The ugly one is Zekar. What we want is your money. Hand over all your cash, and you'll be unharmed. Before you do anything rash, think it over a while. I'm sure your life is worth more than the little gold you might possess. Uh, we're not giving him our gold simply because uh, we need it. And uh, yeah, we're just not giving him our gold. Greedy bandits, you infest our roads with your stink. Draw steel. Stupid, stupid. Now you die. All right. Excellent. What Same strategy as normal, we're going to back off and reposition the party members so that the front line is in the front line. We're going to go ahead and have Khalid make sure he's using his sword. He is. Frontliners will advance. Backliners actually... What? 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 Okay, apparently a pack of wild dogs has decided to just roam on by. That's fine. We'll just dispatch them real quick and then go back to the bandits that are trying to steal our money. I'm not surprised. Okay, now that that awkward diversion is taken care of, we will go ahead and cast... Uh, let's go ahead and... Oh my goodness, what is this? What is this? One... So the DM rolled a D6 to see if wandering passing dogs had, had joined the fray. That was a thing that DMs had to do in original d and I'm sure there were rules for it in ad and although I can't quite remember, where the DM had to roll dice to see if while the party was just doing something, if random enemies popped up. Typically that was only during resting, but yeah, there was supposed to be this ongoing constant check, like if the party was just sitting around faffing about, then uh, yes, the DM was supposed to roll to see if 1d6 wild dogs appeared. So apparently that's what happened. Anyway, Bless is cast. We're gonna go ahead and I think we're gonna wanna drop, drop the bark skin on Kali. So Khalid has an AC of negative one. Now let's see what happens after this. Oh, still uh, armor class of negative one. Wait, what? Okay, but removing all of his gear puts him at two. Huh. Is Barkskin not good anymore? I thought it stacked to a point. Increasing base armor class to 6 plus 1. This is throws. In addition, saving throws versus all attack forms except magic gain a plus 1 bonus. Huh. Okay, so maybe bark skin is only good if you don't actually wear armor. I suppose the way it works now is... Similar to how many effects work in Baldur's Gate's AD&D. When you have two effects that are stacked, that both do the same thing, you don't add them together, you take whichever one is higher. And since Khalid's base armor class itself is higher, then, uh, yeah, what a rude, what a rude surprise. I bet any of you who knew that that was going to happen were probably listening to my, listening to my earlier very, very long detailed explanation of why Bark Skin was good and chuckling to yourself, thinking, oh Chesney, oh Chesney, just you wait. Well, if that's the case, we really don't want Bark Skin. The plus one versus any any source but spell? Spell is probably the one we want to have the plus one against the most. So, uh, I don't know. We don't need fine traps for obvious reasons. I guess we just double up on Charm Person? This seems so boring. All right, well, let's take slow poison, I guess. Now we have two people oh, who can remove poison. Work. I guess that's never a bad thing. Okay, let's inch up here. 
try to grab one of these guys' attention. Where are they? I thought they were closer than this. Did they not follow us? Where'd they go? Okay. So we have a mage, Jembi. Tengen looks like he might be some kind of cleric. We really want to stop Ten uh, Jembi from casting whatever it is she's casting. So we'll open up with magic missile and the entire, entire rest of the party will fire a salvo of ranged rounds at her. Unfortunately, she was successful in casting her mirror image spell. It's going to make it very difficult to actually hurt her. We're going to back up with the round reset and then again focus fire on the mage. The mage is the more dangerous of the two at the present time. Oh, and that's a dead mage. What happened here? She suffered from casting failure due to Khalid hitting her with a bow and then died that when another or hitting her with an arrow obviously she she wasn't hit by the bow anyway that's Jembi down I'm not surprised, but what? no need to use ranged attacks now we'll focus primarily on our friend Tengen here who is not a cleric but is just a fighter presumably in fact Khalid can jump in here with his longsword why not He's more proficient with it. Oh, and these guys are apparently considered to be bandits, so we get a scout from that. Mage robes, rolls, very nice. Healing potion, another scalp, and some gold. Oh, and a quarter staff for Dinah Hair. It's Christmas. Dinah Hair gaining that level. Gonna go ahead and take that, which is putting us up to level two. Ha. <sighs> I hate web. Yeah, I know, technically it can be useful, but I hate web. Web is so frustrating to use because you have to maneuver your party and make sure they don't get hit. All right, well, anyway, let's see what strength does. Application of the spell sets strength of character to 18, then adds 50% bonus on top of this? Oh, no, 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 no. Adds 50% exceptional strength. In my mind, I thought that meant they got 18 and then 50% of 18 is 9, so they actually had 27, which makes no sense. Okay, so they have exceptional strength or extraordinary strength or whatever it's called of 1850. Okay. Does anyone need that? Luther doesn't. Well, okay, Kali could benefit from it. So could Jahira if she's ever fighting melee version. In melee mode. Uh, well, okay, so taking a single strength spell isn't the worst. Detect evil is hilariously awful and is only used for people attempting to roleplay or have fun. I mean, again, as a child, I took detect evil with me all the time and ran around casting it because it was fun to see what everyone's alignment is, but mechanically speaking, it's of no real use to anyone. Uh, so we'll go ahead and go with web since we don't need two strength spells. No, not in here. That might work. At least Khalid will be on par, strength stat-wise, with Luther after that. Ah, and this must be the ugly Here one, Zekar. That was a quick fight. Okay, well, geez. A lot has happened in this episode. A lot of side questing has happened in this episode. We still have the entire map to visit and attempt to locate what I'm pres assuming is the rest of these half ogres for Bjornin. Bjornin is never going to believe all the tall tales we tell him when we come back into the jovial juggler and share a pint with him. Yeah, so first there was like uh well there was like this hobgoblin bandit group that tried to kill us and then this crazy guy who was resurrecting dead people and then wild dogs attacked us and then there was another bandit group and Bjornin is just going to sit lean back his chair and go, uh-huh, sure, Luther, sure. Anyway, quite an eventful side quest episode. Thank you for joining me, as always, my friends. I hope your life is going swimmingly, and if it's not hanging there, it will always at least stand a chance of getting better. I'm not going to lie to you and promise that life always gets better, but come on, as long as you can hang in there and keep working at it, it tends, it tends to improve. So, at any rate, oh, great, we have a null. Sounds like a... Sounds like a uh, medical condition. Oh, there's two. And he ran away. Good. All right. What? A pearl? Jeez, those things aren't cheap. Anyway, thank you so much, my friends. I will see you in the next one.